In 2018, there was a tropical storm in the Atlantic that reached a Category 4 cyclone by the time it was heading toward the southeastern coast of the United States. And when Hurricane Florence was initially approaching, people took notice and began making preparations. But then it diminished to a Category 1 storm and seemed to veer off. And people felt relieved that they had been spared. But the meteorologist and the hydrologist warned that the rain that had fallen had to go somewhere. And they warned those lying in flood zones to get out while there was time. And initially, they had 10 days to rent U-Hauls, to clear out their entire homes, to get out with all of their possessions. And then a couple of days later, they still had time to load up their vehicles with their pets and their most precious possessions. And all the while, there were these offers of assistance. We will come, we'll help, we'll relief if you'll just let us know what you need. But as the days went by and the people lingered, when the floods finally came, they were forced to flee to their rooftops and they were rescued with boats and helicopters with nothing on what they were wearing. Uh, 42 people died. They had lingered too late. All that was needed was for them to acknowledge their need to act on that danger and to ask for the relief that was offered and they would have been spared. And the earlier they had responded to this, the better off they would have been. But the longer they waited, the more it cost them. And for some of them, they waited too long and it cost them everything. In our passage today at the end of Matthew chapter 11, Jesus is going to issue warnings to us to respond to the judgment that's coming while there's still time to respond to it. Because the longer we wait, the more severe the consequences become. Then he's going to explain why is it that some respond and others don't. And that that ultimately rests in the sovereignty of God and not just simply in the choices of humanity. But then he's going to offer this gracious invitation that if anyone will acknowledge their danger and admit their need and come to them, that he will give them rest. So I invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, where we will see Jesus' warning denunciations, his revealing prayer, and finally, his gracious invitation. Would you please pray with me as we get ready to open God's Word? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather on this Lord's Day when we remember that you rose from the dead. Every Sunday is a reminder that this is the birth of a new creation, that on this day, 2,000 years ago almost, that you rose bodily from the grave in victory over sin and death, having died on the cross for our sins and now ascended to the right hand of the throne of God. But you are coming again, and then you will judge the living and the dead. And until then, you leave people the opportunity to repent of their sins and embrace you as Savior while there is still time. And you leave us who have experienced your mercy as your messengers to tell other beggars where they too can find food. So we pray this morning that you would open our minds and our hearts to understand and embrace this truth. And then you would strengthen our will to apply it as we leave here today. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Then links this section with the preceding section where Jesus had confirmed that John the Baptist was indeed the long-promised prophet who came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for the long-promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. But when John came, people denounced him as an ascetic. He only eats locust and uh, he wears camel's hair, and that doesn't sound like anything I want to be involved with. And he has judgmental words to say about sinners. Then Jesus came, and he was eating and drinking with sinners. Lo and behold, now people complained, He's a glutton. He's a friend of sinners. The reality was, whomever God sent, God's people rejected him. Because at the end of the day, we want people to tell us what we want to hear. And neither John nor Jesus, either in which form of message it came, was telling them a message that they wanted to hear, and so they rejected them. And so Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. You'll remember that after his baptism, and then after his temptation, Jesus commenced a public ministry in Galilee, the northern section of Israel, where he was going around to all the cities and the villages, telling them that the kingdom of God was at hand, because the king of God was at hand. And the appropriate response of this was to repent of their sins and to embrace Jesus as their savior. So Jesus has been traveling around with this message. He sent his apostles out in chapter 10 with this message. 
And then to validate his identity and to verify his message, Jesus performed many public miracles. He was healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, casting out demons, controlling storms and nature, even raising the dead. And this wasn't just something to show that he was a miracle worker. It wasn't just to alleviate the, the troubles that people were having. They were all signifying signs to indicate this one comes with God's authority because this one comes with God's message. And if he showed you an undeniable miracle, you should believe the message. But they didn't. They saw, but they didn't believe. And so Jesus begins to say to them, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which had occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say it will be more to tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Chorazin and Bethsaida were neighboring towns from Capernaum, which was the town on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus had made the home base of his ministry. Both these small towns lay within three miles. Uh, Tyre and Sidon, on the other hand, were Phoenician coastal cities that were notorious for their wickedness. The Old Testament mentions them 67 times, often in the context of condemning them for their arrogance, their immorality, their idolatry, their self-indulgence because of their wealth. These are two radically contrasting two Jewish cities, two Gentile cities, two relatively righteous cities, two entirely wicked cities. Two cities that would expect God's blessing, but now we're told they are going to receive a more significant judgment. Now, imagine if a pastor in Denton were to say, Woe to you, Argyle. Woe to you, Aubrey. Because your judgment is going to be more severe than San Francisco and New Orleans. Now, Aubrey and Argy Argyle, Argyle citizens would, rec would recognize they're not perfect. But we're not New Orleans. We're not San Francisco. We're not Atlantic City. And yet Jesus says the shocking and offensive statement, judgment will be more severe for you. Why? Because... If the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Had God in His sovereignty sent prophets to them and done the miracles in those cities that were done in Bethsaida and Chorazon, they would have recognized God is here, God is at hand, and they would have responded appropriately by repenting and confessing their sins. They would have done this publicly in the way common in the ancient Near East, you would have worn coarse, abrasive clothing made of camel's hair, sackcloth, and then you would have sat down and covered yourself in ashes. So do you remember when the prophet Jonah went to the Gentile city Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and said, in just a few more days, God is going to judge the city, and the king of Nineveh said, everyone is going to wear sackcloth, coarse garments, even the animals. Everyone's going to fast. And he sat down in an ash heap, and he covered himself with ashes. So this was a public demonstration over their grief and remorse over their offending God and their public repentance that they knew they had done wrong and wanted to do right. Those cities would have responded, but you cities, when God himself came in the person of Jesus Christ, saw, and yet you did not believe. And now Jesus even brings that closer to home. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You will descend to Hades, for if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Woe to you, Denton. It will be less tolerable for you than for Las Vegas in the day of judgment. Now, Denton's not perfect, but we're not Sin City. And yet there's this sobering warning you should have repented. You should have recanted because you were given more testimony, more evidence, more light, and you will be judged according to the light that was allotted you. You thought you'd be raised up to heaven. You're going to go to the far extreme and be cast down into Hades, which was the abode of the unrighteous dead. Now, there's several things that we need to unpack here in this passage. First of all, there will be a day of judgment. There is a day of reckoning. Jesus is going to mention this twice more in this paragraph, twice more in the book of Matthew, and then he's going to dedicate an entire chapter, Matthew 25, to showing what it's going to be like when the King of Heaven comes, sits on His throne of judgment, and summons all the nations of the earth before Him 
to separate the sheep from the goats. Moses calls, judge, calls God the judge of all the earth. The psalmist sings several times that the Lord is coming to judge the earth. Isaiah prophesies that the Messiah is going to come with a rod in his mouth to judge the earth. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 2.5, Because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of judgment. Peter says that the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. So from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible consistently and repeatedly and soberingly teaches there will be a day of judgment. There is a day of reckoning. There is that great getting up morning, as they used to sing of in the South in the 1950s and 60s. Judgment is coming. Secondly, God warns us of judgment so that we won't receive it. He warns us of judgment so that we'll respond in time and repent while there's still time. So Nineveh repented and God spared them. Even Ahab repented and God spared him. And now we are here with a message of the good news of Jesus Christ that goes out to the ends of the earth so that people will hear the very good news that God loves you so much that he doesn't want you to experience his holy wrath when he comes. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to bear that wrath for you. God is holy. He can't simply overlook sins and transgressions. God is just. It would be unjust for him not to deal with the injustices of the world. So either you can bear that judgment or you can let Jesus bear that judgment for you. And so the plea of the gospel is repent of your sins and embrace Jesus while there's time because you can't bear God's judgment. It's unbearable. And so we have this window to respond in mercy. Thirdly, God's judgment will take into account the amount of light received or rejected. Uh, ignorance of the law is no excuse, but it is a mitigating factor. And what Jesus teaches here is that those who have had more light, more revelation, more truth, more opportunities to respond and kept rejecting, 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 there will be a more significant punishment for them. You are culpable for your choices. You are responsible for that revelation. And that will be something that God will take into account. So I attended an event on the UNT campus one time. And as I was leaving, it was dark. And I started driving home and a campus officer pulled me over. And so I did what I was taught. I turned on my dome light, spread my hands on the steering wheel out of respect to let him know I wasn't a threat in any way. And he said, do you realize that you're going the wrong way on a one way? And I said, no, sir, I'm a visitor. I didn't see the sign. I'm very sorry. And he let me off with a warning. Uh, in contrast, I know a person who was stopped by an officer speeding and running a red light on Eagle and Carroll. And as the officer began to give them a scolding for their unsafe driving, he said, you can either give me a, tic a ticket or a lecture, but not both. Uh, he got both. <laughs> And the ticket became more severe and the lecture became more long because he knew he was wrong. He was non-repentant and therefore he was held more responsible. So a factor, if you've ever wondered about what do those who have never heard, God will take that into account. Because fourthly, this is one of the passages in scripture that suggests there will be different degrees of judgment and different experiences of judgment in hell. Let's look at a few of these. Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, The slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much, of him they will ask all the more. There was a different level of gifts. There was a different amount of responsibility, therefore, associated with those gifts. Jesus says in John 9, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. You do have more knowledge of the law, you Pharisees, you scribes. And therefore, you have more responsibility to obey that law. James says, To the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So those of you who are parents, if you have children of different ages, you know that you hold children more accountable the older they get. 
you hold a two-year-old to a different standard than a five-year-old, than a 10-year-old, than a 15-year-old. You're older now. You know better. You have more information. We've addressed this before. Therefore, the culpability rises. In the book of Revelation, when it reveals Judgment Day, the Apostle John says, I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. So far as we know, Mahatma Gandhi and the Dalai Lama died outside of Christ, and therefore Christ will separate them from God on the day of judgment. But that does not mean that they will experience the same judgment in eternity as Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler. They will each be judged according to their deeds. Now, we don't know exactly what this is going to look like. Uh, it's likely not going to be Dante's levels of hell where everybody gets poetic justice. Although, maybe the thing that makes me angriest on a regular basis is when I'm driving down the highway and have the courtesy to hit my signal and the car behind me accelerates to cut me off and I've imagined a level of hell where they drive eternally trying to get over and every car keeps cutting them off and that would be due justice and judgment. So we don't know what it's going to look like, but what is clear is that there will be justice. And that means not everyone will be treated alike because not everyone lived alike. Not everyone received the same amount of revelation of God's truth, so they won't be held to the same standard. We don't, again, know as much details as we might wish, but there is enough indication in Scripture to indicate that there will be differences. The point, though, is obey, respond, repent, believe, take advantage of the mercy while it's offered. Take advantage of deliverance and rescue and salvation while it's offered, while there's still time. But why do some respond and others don't? Is it that some of us were more spiritually sensitive? That we were more uh, tender to the things of God? That we were more open to the gospel of Jesus Christ? No. Ultimately, we are all sinners, separated from God. There is no good in us. God determines ultimately whom are saved and who is not. Look at verses 25 through 27. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was way well-pleasing in your sight. The wise and intelligent are those who are wise and intelligent in their own eyes. The proud, the smug, the self-reliant. Uh, the infants in the Gospels are those who humbly acknowledge, I need someone to teach me. I need correction. Uh, it's why that our children and our toddlers respond to our instruction and they ask a thousand whys. And that's different from our teenagers who are less receptive of our instruction because they think they know it all or at least they know better than their parents. Uh, you've probably seen the sign at Bucky's or elsewhere that says, attention teens, are you tired of listening to your parents? Move out, get a job. Pay your bills. Act now while you still know everything. <laughs> and, and we all went through that period where we thought we knew everything. Or at least we knew better. And for those in their pride and their arrogance that think they have their act together and don't need to listen to God and be rebuked and reproved by Him, God can judgmentally hide things from them. God can, like Pharaoh, harden their hearts. Or we can reject truth so much that like a callus that builds up on a piece of skin through repetitive striking, we can callous our heart to the things of God. And God ultimately, though, is sovereign in choosing whom He reveals His truth to and not. Psalm 115.3 says, Our God is in the heavens and He does whatever He pleases. God is sovereign over all things. And ultimately, God decides whom He saves and whom He does not. God is the governor, God is the president, who is the chief executive, has the authority to pardon criminals on death row. And when he does so, that's his prerogative. All of the criminals are there because they got justice. Some received mercy. That was not fair, they weren't treated all alike, but it was not unjust. 
authority resided in the executive to pardon some, and he did. It also resided in him to let some receive their justice, and he did. In both cases, justice was done. And so God ultimately decides, which is why Jesus says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. There is an intimate knowledge between the Father and the Son that is unique, but the Father sent the Son to disclose that to whom? To anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. All authority has been given to Jesus. All authority is His on heaven and on earth. And this includes the authority to select whom He reveals the Father in a saving way. Now, this isn't the text or the time to go in depth into the controversial and the confusing and the contentious subject of sovereignty and free will, election predestination, but this is one of the texts that teaches it. And so I do want to briefly make seven comments about that topic. First, the Old Testament clearly teaches that God sovereignly selects those whom He uses to accomplish His saving purposes. God was the one who chose Shem over Ham and Japheth. God chose Abram as his covenantal vessel, not Nahor or Haran. He chose Isaac, not Ishmael. He chose Jacob, not Esau. He chose Judah among the 12 tribes. He chose Israel among the nations. This isn't a one-off. The consistent theme of Scripture is that God chooses whom He uses, and God selects whom He saves. This is a consistent theme running through Scripture. Secondly, the New Testament clearly teaches that God sovereignly selects some to salvation. To quote two of what could be manifold verses. When the Gentiles heard this, says Acts 13, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. The message went out. Who responded? Those whom had been appointed to eternal life. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the kind intention of His will. And the reason why it has to be according to God's will is because our wills are fallen. And fallen, sinful human beings can't respond to the offer of the gospel apart from God's sovereign work of grace in our hearts. This is the words of Jesus in John 6. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. John 6, 65. No one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. So the message goes out, the invitation goes out, come to me, any who will. Who are the wills who come? Those whom God opens the eyes of their hearts to be able to respond to that. Fourthly, Scripture and personal experience clearly teach that humans have free will. We're not robots. We're not automatons. Uh, you chose what to eat today, what to wear today, whether to come today. Uh, even the children were, chose whether to be compliant or resistant to decide what hearts you were going to come and attend and receive in. You made choices. We all make choices. We're made in the image of God, and we have this act of will that God lets us use and we're responsible for. Fifthly, how God's sovereignty and our free will fit together is a mystery. It's one of the three central mysteries of the Bible. We can't understand the Trinity, how God is one and yet three, but we affirm both because the Bible affirms both. We don't understand how Jesus could be fully God and fully man at the same time. But that's what the Bible teaches. And so we affirm that. And we don't know how exactly God's sovereignty and our free will respond. But they do. They're both true. And we shouldn't be daunted by this word mystery. There's mystery in every field of knowledge. Now, physicists don't exactly know how light can be both a particle and a wave, but it has the properties of both. Now, astrophysicists... If you ask them, what is most of the universe made of, they'll respond mysteriously, dark matter. 85% of the mass of the universe is dark matter. Well, how do we know it's there? 
There's no empirical evidence for it. There's no test, there's no evidence, there's no microscope. But if there's not more mass than we can detect, then the math doesn't work. So they invent 85% of the universe as some mysterious matter we have no evidence for because if it's not there, the math doesn't work. So don't be daunted with mystery. We, we deal with mystery in every area of knowledge. Sixthly, the Bible calls us to affirm what it affirms, to deny what it denies, and to obey what it commands, not to fully understand and explain everything that it teaches. We can't fully understand and explain anything and yet we still embrace the knowledge that we have and move on. And the same thing with the things of God, and even more so. Uh, C.S. Lewis gave an analogy of this in an essay called Transposition. So we have a number of musicians here, and you can take a Bach, well, I'm looking at you, you can take a Bach cantata and fugue that was written for har harpsichord that has 60, 60 keys on a harpsichord, 80, 88 on a piano. But have you ever heard a classical guitarist play a Bach cantata and fugue? They do. So how do you get on six strings what was originally written for 60 keys? Well, you have to accommodate. It's not the full expression of what was originally there. Uh, I was giving this analogy to Chris and he says, you know, for me it wouldn't be a six string guitar, it'd be the one string thud bucket. <laughs> you know, he'd be doing it this way. But when you go from something complex to something simple, things are lost in translation. And it doesn't mean that they're contradictory or untrue, it just means we lack the capacity to express all the reality that's there. And so that's true in this area as well. Deuteronomy says that the secret things belong to God, but the things re revealed belong to us and our children that we would obey them. The secret things belong to God. There's mystery, there's unknowns. But the things revealed belong to us and our children so that we can obey them. We affirm what the Bible affirms. We deny what it denies. We obey what it commands. We're not going to understand all this. And seventhly, Scripture clearly teaches that God so loved the world that He sent His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We can't get hung up on the things that are uncomfortable or confusing or even a little bit disconcerting. There is a clear teaching that a holy God is coming to judge unholy sinners someday, but He doesn't want to do so, so He sends His Son. That's a wrong expression. He also is a loving God who, in His great love, sent His Son to become a human being to perfectly obey the law that we could never perfectly obey, to die on the cross for the sins that we committed, to rise bodily from the grave to demonstrate God's acceptance of that sacrifice, so that now, as a gift of God's grace, we by faith can say, I want that. Jesus saved me, and we will be born from above. We will become new creations of Christ. We will become like snow, though our sins were like scarlet. We will become adopted as sons and daughters of the living God. And that's the beautiful way that this powerful passage ends. Look at verses 28 through 30. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Notice, first of all, whom Jesus gives this offer to, the weary and the heavy laden. Most of us try to avoid the weary and heavy laden, lest their weariness become more burdensome on us. But Jesus welcomes them. It's like the, stat it's like the poem, the new Colossus on the Statue of Liberty. Don't give me your hallowed people from your, give me your poor and downcast. I want them. I'll take them. And so Jesus gives the open invitation, if you're weary and if you're heaven laden, then I invite you to come to me. Now in context of the Gospel of Matthew, this is probably talking most specifically about those who have been wearied by all the rules and regulations of the Pharisees. Those who are burdened by the religiosity that encumbered God's truth. And so Jesus says, for those of you who are weary trying to obey all the rules and the regulations and to uh, keep all the rituals of religiosity, just come to me and you'll find rest for your souls. Now, I grew up in a very legalistic tradition that was very strong on rules and regulations. And so on field trips, boys and girls swam in pools at different times. When we went to Six Flags, we wore jeans. So we always knew the people in our church group at Six Flags, we were the only ones there in jeans. And all this list of do's and don'ts, 
and, and it put me in fear of God. Because when I read my Bible every night like I was supposed to, I kept reading things that I shouldn't be doing that I was or that I should be doing that I wasn't. And I lived in fear of God until someone told me the gospel that salvation had nothing to do with me, that I could never be so good as to earn it, I could never be so good as to maintain it, nor could I be so wicked as to put myself out of Christ's love once he embraced me. It's because of Christ, not me. And it was the most liberating thing I had ever heard. I was freed of that burden. I was relieved of that weariness and I found rest for my souls. And so Jesus goes on to say, come to me. Don't stay where you are, exhausted and weighted down. Don't distract yourself with diversions. Don't deny that there's things in our life that are displeasing to God or deny that he's going to hold me accountable for those someday. Don't look anywhere else. Don't go anywhere else because there's salvation in no other name but in Jesus Christ. He is the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father but through him. If you're weary and heavy laden, trying to keep doing the right thing and earn God's pleasure and earn your mer enough merit to keep salvation, Jesus relieves you of all that burden. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you peace. And not just a false notion that things are right, but a true wellness of being that says, there is now for all who have been justified by Christ, peace with God. Right now you're his child. And nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ. Neither height, nor depth, nor angel, nor principality, or any other created thing. Once we are justified, once we are redeemed, we're secure and we're safe. And there's rest, and there's comfort, and there's peace, even as we struggle to do things more pleasing to God. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now, a yoke was a wooden bar that you would put over the shoulders of draft animals so that they could pull together in harness the way that the driver directed them. And this was used as an analogy among Pharisee scribes, uh, scribes and rabbis for the teachings that you followed. So you would come to a rabbi, you would come to a teacher, he would give you a yoke of lessons to direct you in your life. And Jesus says, take that heavy yoke off, you can't pull it. Take my yoke on you because it's light. What do you have to do to be saved? Just embrace Christ. What do you have to do? And everything that Jesus writes and teaches are intended to make our life better. It's the thief that comes to break in and steal, kill, and destroy. Christ came that we might have life and have it abundantly. It's not burdensome for husbands to love their wives. It's blessed. It's not weighty for wives to respect their husbands. That's how you have a blessed marriage. It's not hard. It's not a hard thing to ask children to submit to their parents or for parents to raise up their children in the fear of the Lord. This is how we have the family and the household that God intends for us. If things are hard and harsh in our lives, it's because we're not responding to the right yoke. We're living life the wrong way. So Jesus invites us once we come to him to begin to apply his teaching. If you're burdened down by finances, Jesus taught us that if we seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, that God's gonna take care of his children. If we're always anxious about the future because we don't know it and we can't control it, we come to Christ and we remember that he told us, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And so Jesus gives us the invitation to come to him. And lest we think that if we come, that we might be rebuffed, that we might be rejected, that I'm not good enough, I'm not godly enough, I'm not holy enough. I've sinned too long, I've sinned too severely. I don't want to be reproached. Jesus says that he is gentle and humble in heart. He does not turn away the one that comes to him. He does not reject the one that comes to him. Do you remember the parable of the prodigal son? The prodigal offensively asked his father, I want my share of the inheritance now. And he took it and he squandered it with loose living. And then as he finally came to his senses, wishing for the food that he was feeding with the pigsties, and he came back saying, and he prepared his speech to his father, Father, I have sinned against you. Take me back as one of your servants. I'm not worthy to be called your son. But do you remember the response of the father? He saw him, he ran to him, he embraced him, he put the ring on the finger, the road on his back, the sandals on his feet. He restored him not as a servant, but as a son. And that's the God we serve. All he wants is us to come home. All he wants is us to come back. 
And no one will be rejected who comes because Jesus is gentle and humble in heart. And He, and only He, can give us rest for our souls, can give us eternal peace with God because He reconciles us with God, our Creator, through the Redeemer, whom we will spend forever and ever with Trevor. So the primary application of this passage is evangelistic. God gave Jesus all authority. Jesus the judge tells us that judgment day is coming and that if we have light of revelation, we are responsible for that. So receive it. Embrace that good news while there's time. Admit that you're not perfect and so you'll never please a perfect God. But you can't. You weren't intended to. God did that in Jesus. All you have to do is admit your need. God, I'm a sinner. Jesus saved me. And if you truly embrace that in your heart, you will become a child of God, a son or daughter of the living God. Jesus also has been given authority to reveal the Father to whomever He wills. And whom does He invite? He says, come. He says, come. And those who come to Jesus, those who choose Jesus, will know that they were chosen by Jesus. You don't have to wrestle with the mysteries of predestination election. Respond. And if you respond, you will know that you were chosen. But do respond. But there is also, apart from the evangelistic uh, application, there's also an ongoing application for us Christians because we continue to be burdened, don't we? Uh, some of you were here on Christmas Day when uh, I fainted in the pulpit. And so I was here and uh, I don't remember exactly what happened. I began dozing, I saw the video and I began dozing and weaving and my brother ran to catch me. And this chair is here every Sunday, just in case. <laughs> and it's a reminder. And so when I went home from just this exhaustion, the verse that kept going through my mind again and again was, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Jesus, I'm weary, I come to you. Jesus, I'm weary, I come to you. Because I shouldn't think that the burden of building the church lies on me. God help us. Jesus builds the church. Jesus builds the church. But we forget that, don't we? And so I become weary and heavy laden. And I come to Jesus and he gives me rest. And I go back and I learn from him and realize, Jesus builds the church. It's His church. I just have to be faithful to what He asked me to do. You're not responsible for ministry. If you think that you're responsible to lead someone to Christ, you can't do that. Only God can open a soul. And that could be burdensome and that could weigh heavy on you. But if you just come to Jesus and let Him give you rest, Jesus says, abide in me and then I will bear much fruit in and through you. A branch can't produce fruit on its own. It can only bear fruit as it abides in the vine. And I need to be reminded of that truth. Many of you are struggling with anxieties over perhaps relational conflicts. And so you need to come to Jesus with that and be reminded that blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons and daughters of the living God. And that if I am at the altar presenting my sacrifice and I realize that my brother has something against me, that I've wronged someone, that I have to leave my sacrifice and go and be reconciled and then come back. And if someone's wronged me, I have to forgive them, even if they're an enemy even if it's 70 times seven. And that weight that I was carrying, that was wearing on my soul, if I go to Jesus and remind myself of what he's taught me, my burden becomes light. Y'all are burdened. Uh, kids are burdened with activities, students with studies, teachers with teaching students their studies, workers with their jobs, spouses with their marriages, parents with their kids, kids with their parents. We are a weighted down burdened people. Go to Jesus. Don't be afraid. He's gentle and humble in heart. And He and only He can give you rest for your souls. Go to Him and remind yourself that when you came, you put yourself under His tutelage. You put yourself under His yoke. You became a disciple of the Lord. And now He tells you how to treat your spouse, how to treat your children, how to respond to your parents, what kind of employer to be, what kind of employee to be, what kind of citizen to be, what our hope is in the future so we don't get discouraged by the present. We go back to Jesus' teaching and our Lord gives us peace and His instruction gives us rest. Hear the words of Jesus, God the Son, Lord and Savior. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this beautiful passage. Uh, although we don't like 
to hear of coming judgment, we need the warning. And so we thank you that you have revealed to us that there is a time to respond and we pray for the grace to respond. Father, it's uncomfortable hearing that you choose whom chooses you, but there's comfort of that knowing that we wouldn't do that on our own, but you can sovereignly open any mind and any heart to understand and embrace the gospel. And if there is anyone here who hasn't yet done that, would today be the day of their adoption, of their deliverance? And Father, we thank you for the wondrous invitation to come to you, not because we're deserving, not because we've earned it, not because we offer anything. We come in neediness. We come in destitution. We come wearied and heavy laden to the one who can give us rest. Teach us to do this. Teach us to unburden ourselves to you daily and then to be able to point others to show them the same Lord that bids them to come and find rest for their souls. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.